Hello, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing alcohol withdrawal. The first thing to talk about is that not all alcohol withdrawal looks the same. Among patients with heavy chronic alcohol use, there are in fact four different withdrawal syndromes. If we consider them in order of increasing severity, the first doesn't have a catchy name, but is usually referred to as minor withdrawal and consists of anxiety, headache, diaphoresis, tremor, tachycardia, and palpitations. In patients who develop this syndrome, it typically occurs within 6 to 24 hours after the last drink and often does not feel minor to the patient. While the symptoms persist for as long as a week, it is rare for them to start more than 2 to 3 days into a period of sobriety. The next most dangerous clinical syndrome is still relatively benign, but much rarer. It's called alcoholic hallucinosis. In this, patients develop hallucinations, which are classically visual or tactile, such as the sensation of insects crawling on them, but the patients are not confused. They know where they are and understand that they are experiencing hallucinations. Alcoholic hallucinosis can occur as early as 12 hours after the last drink, but 24 to 36 hours is more typical. Withdrawal seizures are usually brief with a short postictal period. Prolonged seizures is not typical of withdrawal and should prompt a search for another etiology. Last, the most dangerous and luckily a relatively uncommon syndrome is delirium tremens, usually abbreviated DT. For some reason, it's common in speech for people to add on an S to the end and call this DTs, as in my patient developed DTs last night, but it's not a plural word. The S doesn't belong. DT consists of delirium, severe tachycardia, severe hypertension, and severe hyperthermia. These patients have a critically unstable autonomic nervous system, and DT is what makes alcohol withdrawal potentially life-threatening. The onset of DT occurs later than the other syndromes, 48 to 96 hours after the last drink. A few more words about DT. Almost all patients who develop DT had some other manifestations of withdrawal leading up to it. Although classic descriptions, like the one I just gave, imply that there's a sharp transition point between minor withdrawal and DT, there's often not. Instead, you can see a pattern in which minor withdrawal progressively gets more and more severe until profound anxiety transitions into delirium and tachycardia transitions into hemodynamic instability. Risk factors for DT include a history of DT or withdrawal seizures, age over 30, concurrent illness, and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal while the blood alcohol concentration is still elevated, which implies very heavy consistent alcohol use. Even with treatment, the mortality from DT is about 5%. Given that alcohol withdrawal has a wide spectrum of severity from barely noticeable to imminently life-threatening, It's important to be able to risk stratify patients based on the probability of developing severe withdrawal. The best validated way is with the PAUSE score, PAUSE standing for Prediction of Alcohol Withdrawal Severity Scale. To determine if a patient should even have a PAUSE score calculated, ask if they've consumed any alcohol within the past 30 days, or look to see if they've had a positive blood alcohol level on this admission. If the answer to either question is yes, they get their first point on the scoring system, and the rest of the test should be administered. They get a point each for experiencing at least one prior withdrawal episode, a withdrawal seizure, an episode of DT, if they've undergone alcohol rehab treatment of any kind, have experienced alcohol-related blackouts, have combined alcohol with benzos or barbiturates within the last 90 days, or combined alcohol with any other substances of abuse within the last 90 days. They also get a point if their BAL on admission was over 200 milligrams per deciliter, and a point if the patient is already experiencing minor withdrawal symptoms. With this scale, the maximum score is 10 points. A score of 4 or higher places the patient at a high risk of severe withdrawal. When it comes to treating withdrawal, the first decision to make is whether a patient needs to be admitted. I recommend admitting patients when the following are true. First, the patient needs to clearly state a desire to abstain from alcohol. If the patient is not willing to even say that, 
then there's no point in admitting them, and it may even be dangerous to twist their arm and subject them to withdrawal when they are highly likely to just resume drinking upon discharge. But if they do state a desire to stop, then consider if at least one of the following are also present. A pause score of four or more, any history of withdrawal seizures or DT, symptoms of withdrawal while the BAL is still elevated, baseline cognitive impairment that will prevent safe outpatient use of benzos, unstable psychiatric disease, and an inability to make daily or near daily appointments during the withdrawal period. If any of those are present, in my opinion, the patient should be admitted for monitored alcohol withdrawal treatment. Now, what do you treat them with? Benzodiazepines are the first line treatment for all forms of alcohol withdrawal. In the US, there are three commonly used for this purpose. First is diazepam, better known by the brand name Valium. This has the fastest onset of the three, is relatively long acting, and is available in both IV and oral forms. Diazepam is my go-to benzo for most patients in withdrawal. Typical initial doses are five to 10 milligrams, either IV or PO. The IV form can be repeated every five to 10 minutes until symptoms are improved. The goal state for your patient should be calm and maybe even a little drowsy, but easily arousable and able to converse. The next benzo is lorazepam, also known as Ativan. It's relatively short acting, which makes for a less smooth course in patients, but because of differences in its metabolism, is believed to be safer in liver disease. So this is the benzo of choice in patients who also have either cirrhosis or alcoholic hepatitis. It is available both IV and oral. The typical initial dose is two to four milligrams, either IV or oral, and the IV form can re be repeated every 15 to 20 minutes as necessary. The last common benzo for withdrawal is chlordiazepoxide, better known as Librium. Like diazepam, chlordiazepoxide is long acting, but available in oral form only. So this is a more common drug to use with the outpatient management of withdrawal, often in the form of a short taper over several days. Typical initial doses are 25 to 100 milligrams oral, which can be re repeated as frequently as every two to three hours as needed. It would be great if there was a reliable way to convert typical quantity of alcohol consumed to anticipated benzo requirements, but unfortunately there isn't. However, patients who have required unusually high benzo doses during a prior episode of withdrawal are more likely to require unusually high benzo doses during future episodes. Historically, there were two schools of thought regarding how benzos should be dosed. One school believed in a fixed schedule with a deliberate built-in taper. The other school believed that benzos should only be provided on an as-needed, symptom-triggered basis. But with studies and more experience, the symptom-triggered approach won, as it leads to as good or better outcomes while requiring a much shorter treatment period. To use a symptom-triggered approach, one of course needs a standardized way of quantifying the severity of withdrawal symptoms which is done using something called the CEWA score. The CEWA scoring system assigns zero to seven points for each of 10 clinical criteria, such as anxiety, tremor, headache, orientation, diaphoresis, and hallucinations. The higher the total points, the worse the withdrawal. A score less than eight is considered minimal withdrawal, while over 20 is considered severe. Many hospitals have protocols in place by which nursing will assess a patient's SIBO score at fixed intervals, often Q1 hour when first admitted, and then provide a specific dose of benzo if the patient's score is within a particular range. If the score is below a certain threshold for a specific number of hours, the frequency of assessments is then incrementally decreased. Automatizing the treatment of withdrawal in this way spares doctors from frequent pages, helps to empower nursing, and most importantly, leads to more expedited treatment. On rare occasions, a patient with DT may demonstrate resistance to routine benzodiazepines. Options in this case include a continuous infusion of a benzo, propofol, phenobarbital, or dexmedetomidine. Most, though not all patients who require treatments with any of the above also need to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. 
a minority of experts had advocated for treatment protocols that avoid the routine use of benzodiazepines. So-called benzo-sparing protocols can include the use of clonidine, dexmedetomidine, valproic acid, and gabapentin. However, trial data supporting the use of these protocols is lacking, and their use currently cannot be recommended. There are several historically used treatments which are actually dangerous and should be avoided. Phenytoin is ineffective for withdrawal seizures. Haldol may help psychotic symptoms in hallucinosis and DT, but it lowers the seizure threshold and is not as effective in this particular situation as benzos. And last, beta blockers prevent tachycardia and may help reduce symptoms of mild withdrawal, but it does so by masking the symptoms rather than truly treating the underlying problem, which can delay the recognition and treatment of early DT. A few final considerations. Remember that these patients should also receive supportive care that include IV fluids, thiamine given before glucose to prevent triggering Wernicke's encephalopathy, correction of electrolyte derangements, including hypophosphatemia, and nutritional support. And you also want to identify and treat comorbid conditions, an incomplete list of which includes alcohol-related liver disease, alcoholic gastritis, aspiration pneumonia, pancreatitis, psychiatric disease, and various neurological complications of chronic heavy alcohol use, such as dementia, cerebellar degeneration, and peripheral neuropathy.